My name is Dennis Vaughan and I'm a reproductive endocrinologist at Boston IVF. I wear a few different hats. I'm also the director of clinical research and the co-director of the Anko Fertility Program here at Boston IVF. So what I'd like to talk about today is success rates in assisted reproductive technologies. And this has changed and evolved over time. Initially, we focused on implantation rates, which was the positive pregnancy rate divided by the number of embryos transferred. That sense moved on to clinical pregnancy rates. And now um, we're focusing more on live birth rates per embryo transfer and also cumulative live birth rates for one complete IVF cycle. And more research is starting to focus on perinatal outcomes. We want a full term healthy live birth as well as looking beyond that at neonatal and uh, pediatric outcomes and health of children. So currently IVF success rates largely depend on the age of the patient which we're treating and whether we've done genetic testing on embryos prior to transfer um, but in general IVF success rates are about three to four times higher than those of IUI. So an IUI success rate typically depending on the patient depending on the diagnosis we'll quote somebody somewhere between 10 to 15 percent likelihood of a live birth um, per IUI cycle versus IVF which varies somewhere between 25 to 60 percent depending on again the patient we're treating and whether genetic testing has been done prior to transfer. Currently we're reporting IVF success rates to SART. Uh, SART is a national organization um, which 85 to 90 percent of all clinics in the United States report to and in general when patients are looking to select a clinic for treatment I would encourage patients to look at clinics that specifically report to SART as a quality metric and a monitoring independent agency. Um, IUI success rates currently are not reported to SART which makes it much more difficult for us to track outcomes but at Boston IVF we do it um, pretty rigorously at an internal level, um, but those are not reported nationally to SART. So SART is awesome in terms of being able to get a quick snapshot view of clinic successes. However, there are some limitations and some caveats to the SART reporting, and that's largely because a lot of the details are missed in SART reporting. And so, for example, there are clinics in the US commonly that will not treat certain prognosis patients. And so they, any patients who have a really low likelihood of success often will not be treated by certain clinics. They have cutoffs based on age, based on ovarian reserve, etc. That's not true um, at Boston IVF and generally not true in Massachusetts. They don't go into specifics in terms of the types of patients they're treating nor some of the treatments that the patients have undergone. A good example of this would be PGTA or the use of genetic testing of embryos. We know that if we do genetic testing on embryos that the live birth rate per transfer will be higher. However, not all patients will get to that stage. So not all patients can make fully formed embryos or blastocysts and not all patients if we biopsy a blastocyst will get a euploid embryo or a genetically normal embryo. So we know that the patients who are getting transfer of a euploid embryo might have a live birth rate of 60%, which sounds great, but a lot of patients never get to that point. So you, need, you have to be careful in terms of interpreting data uh, based on embryo transfer, looking to see whether genetic testing has been done or not. Another limitation would be the patients that we treat in Massachusetts, for example, we're very fortunate to have a mandated insurance coverage. So if patients have private insurance in Massachusetts, they can undergo IVF, often up to six cycles of IVF. What that means is that patients who otherwise might stop treatment after two or three IVF cycles owing to financial barriers no longer have that barrier. And so many of our patients undergo three, four or five IVF cycles where appropriate following counseling with the physician, but it ends up um, resulting in more IVF cycles per patient. So those patients naturally are going to be poorer prognosis patients. Those patients naturally will have lower success rates because it's their third or fourth or fifth IVF cycle um, that they're undergoing. So important to make that distinction. Um, and also 
you know, the patients that we treat, a lot of the times we're seeing second opinion, third opinion, fourth opinion patients. They've done two IVF cycles at one clinic. They come to see another clinic, do another two cycles, and then come to Boston IVF as a third opinion. So about 30 or 40% of the patients that I see in Chestnut Hill are second and third opinion patients, which obviously has a negative impact on success rates. Um, so it, it, while it is great to have a national reporting system, there are some caveats because a lot of the detail just isn't there. So Boston IVF is unique in terms of the volume. Boston IVF is one of the biggest IVF clinics in the United States. A really important distinction is that we're academically affiliated. What that means is that the majority of physicians at Boston IVF hold academic appointments at Harvard Medical School. We train residents, medical students, fellows. We practice evidence-based medicine, and we're continuously striving to perform research and deliver the best cutting edge therapies and treatments to our patients in an evidence-based fashion. Um, we've been involved in several landmark studies, including the FAST trial and the FORTY trial, which essentially changed the paradigm for the way patients are treated with unexplained infertility. And we also have 35, 40 physicians on faculty across the network. We perform continuous, rigorous QA, QC checks on all of our protocols and we can retrain embryologists, nurses, physicians where necessary to maintain the standards that we all set for ourselves. So we're fortunate at Boston IVF because of the expertise both within our laboratory but also our physicians and our nursing team that we've got some of the best success rates in the country and part of that is owing to our protocols that we have in place to monitor our quality throughout the process and retraining, as I said, where necessary and continuously moving to provide the best and latest cutting edge technology to maximize our likelihood of success. So the decision to select a clinic for treatment is a complicated one. There are several facets to it. I would say the SART data is a, is a good starting point um, to get a brief snapshot but really to get an evaluation of the details of the clinic, it really involves you know, several uh, professionals and personal anecdotes. And I, I strongly believe that patients should talk to their gynecologist, their obstetrician, who's interacted with the clinic before, who shared clinics, sh who shared patients with the clinic before, as well as friends and family who've had treatments at clinic and what their experience and success rates have been. So really multifaceted rather than just looking at the start statistics alone. So I hope this is helpful. Defining success and interpreting success rates is challenging, but as always, feel free to reach out to our team, make an appointment with one of our physicians. We'd be happy to go over everything in a lot more detail and nuances, especially as it pertains to your particular case, because um, we know that the treatment of infertility is, is multifaceted and complex and very much takes a personalized team collaborative approach to optimize treatment and ensure best likelihood of success.